Psalm 19. Psalm number 19 is going to be our scripture reading as we worship together this morning. And then we're going to take some time to pray. Dan mentioned as he was praying for the offering about how God has pr pr protected us and taken care of us as his people, our fellowship together. And there are many needs. And so we're going to take some time to pray for each other here this morning. But let's read Psalm 19 first. I'll read these verses. You listen. Psalm 19, verse 1. This is a beautiful picture of God's hand all around us. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech. And night unto night, yet both day and night, showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line, that's day and night, creation. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them, in creation, in the the heavens and the firmament, the, the day and night, in them hath God, he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom, coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. So he gives this picture of the sun and all its glory in God's creation. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit on the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The picture of God's Glory in creation is, is represented in that beautiful sun that gives light to the whole world, right? That's God's glory that's revealed to us. Now, of course, he goes on and talks about the word of God that reveals God's glory to us in Christ. And that's true, too, but the heavens declare the glory of God. We're going to see a little bit of that in our study this morning. Well, let's pause. Let's take a minute to pray. As I pray out loud, you pray from your heart. Lord, let's call upon the Lord. Lord, we, we need you as your people. We're thankful for where we are today in our time in fellowship. We're here together in the house of the Lord. But there are some even that wanted to be here and they can't. And so in that sense, we need you. Because we have no idea what's going to happen from one day to the next. We're glad to be here. We don't know what's going to happen this afternoon, tonight, tomorrow. We look to you, Lord, and we trust you. We trust you for those that are struggling with different things that... We feel so helpless sometimes, and not sometimes, all the time. What can we really do? And so we look to you, Lord. We say, God, help us. You're the one that does your work. You're the great physician. Lead, we pray, those that are struggling with different things, doctors and surgeries. Uh, we pray that you'll help the doctors, give wisdom, provide the medicines, Lord. Do the, do the work that you do through these things, because our hope is in you. So as we pray together this morning, gathered in your name, we, we call upon you to help us in our time of need. There are many needs represented in, here in our fellowship, and even right now, from our hearts, we're, we're laying them at your feet. We're asking you to, 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 to help and, uh, and to bless. Lord, that's the difference when you do your work in our lives. That's the difference. So, so help your people, we pray. We also, Lord, want to pray that the work of the, the kingdom of God, we had our meeting this morning, it, 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 this is... This is, there's nothing greater. The kingdom of God, there's nothing greater. It does look like something. Yeah, we get that. There's a physical part to it. But that wonderful truth that brings us together is one body in the Lord. Christ, the body of Christ. He's the head. And, and Jesus, you have a mission. You, you, you're doing your work because you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, Bless us as your people, your people around the world. Do your work through us, we pray. May, may that work of yours be done faithfully as your people serve. Lord, that's what we want to be, your servants. And we pray through us you do the work in all the ways it looks here, our ministries, through our missionaries. And uh, we pray that that work would prosper. Lord, we're not going to be here forever. You're going to call us home, and then you're going to finish your work on this earth and judging it and, and bringing Israel to its right place. and It's all going to come back to you. But, Lord, we have a mission right now, and so we pray that you'll use us as you give us the opportunity. Closing our time in prayer this morning, what a wonderful blessing to worship together. So we're calling upon you as we, as we trust you and rejoice in you. We, we pray that you'll, you'll be at work around us. There's just so much going on around us. There's so many burdens that we hear and see drugs and wars and it's just awful Lord it's awful there's so much sin 
but yet we have the answer. We know you can do your work. And so our, our prayer is, Lord, that you'll be revealed in everything that's going on around us. We pray that you'll be lifted up. We pray that the gospel would have free course, <laughs> that the word of the Lord would have free course and be glorified. And, uh, and, and that's the hope. That's the, the answer. Revival from, for the church and then that leading out into making a difference, being that witness that you can use to bring lost people to you. So that's how we close. We want, we want to see that all the concerns that we have for our world, we want to see them come to you, come back to you, and we want to see you set up in the midst of everything and glorify because you're the answer. So thank you for this time to pray. We're trusting you, Lord. We know you're at work in each of our lives, and we're thankful for that. Thank you for your word. Always a, a blessing to study it together as we grow together in your word. Build us in our most holy faith, we pray, pointing us to Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So let's take our Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 1 as the young people are dismissed to their time downstairs. Let's let the young people have their time in God's word downstairs in their class. And take your Bible with me to Romans chapter 1. We just started a study in this wonderful letter. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So it's a wonderful word from God for the church at Rome. And it lays the foundation. The, the, the foundation for every church. It's the first letter, remember? It's the first letter to the newly formed churches from the book of Acts. It, just look at the, the way God puts his word together. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, there's Jesus. Now we have the book of Acts. The, the word of Christ comes out, and people are saved. The church is built. And the very first letter, uh, God's word to his church, is about, what, what's the topic? We saw it last week, the gospel. Paul has told us what he wants to talk about in his letter to the Romans. He wants to talk about the gospel of Christ, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He wants to talk about the gospel of God, which is really where it starts in, in chapter 1 and verse, where does he use that phrase, verse 1, about he set apart to the gospel of God. His burden, his heart is for, look at Romans chapter 1 and verse uh, um, 5, for the obedience of the faith preached to all nations. Romans 1, verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So, look at verse 15. Paul wants, wants to preach the gospel in Rome. Verse 15, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And verse 16, for I am not ashamed. And that's where he starts this progression to his first point. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Number two, the word for. The first four, I want to preach the gospel because I'm not ashamed of it. Number two, because it is the power of God and the salvation. And that is what we need. So Paul tells us this morning, he knows that the power of God, he knows that the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. That's what we all need is salvation. So Paul tells us this morning, number one, how the wrath of God is against ungodliness and wickedness of man, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Paul tells us how the wrath of God is against ungodliness and the wickedness of men. And man is wicked. That's what he's going to tell us mostly about this morning. Man is a sinner. Man has turned his back on God. This is what Paul describes for us in our passage this morning. Why we are in desperate need of the gospel. And the power of God to save us. We are sinners. And verse 18 makes it very clear that the wrath of God is against us in our sin. We'll never, we're never going to escape that by our own uh, ability. Look at verse 22. So, so the main thought this morning, as Paul leads into now his main, his first teaching on this idea of the gospel... He says, I'm not ashamed, it's the power of God, because, verse 17, the righteousness of God is revealed to us in the gospel, because, verse 18, the wrath of God is against sinners. Paul's main point this morning is to show us our need as sinners. 
We are in desperate need of salvation. We're sinners. So look at verse 22. It's just one of those thoughts as we look at it together this morning. It's just one of them, but it's the one that stood out to me. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. This is where we are as sinners before the God of heaven, the one who created us. This is where mankind is, folks. And it's just one of the ways to describe us this morning. Fools. Ignorant of the truth, ignorant of what really matters, and actually thinking that we have all the answers. But God says we are foolish. We are, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, Proverbs says, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Thinking ourselves wise, verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became foolish. And verse 32, just to finish the thought, and then we'll get into the, all of it together this morning. Verse 32, facing God's judgment. So look at how he ends this first chapter. Who knowing the judgment of God. Remember verse 18, the wrath of God? Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. We are, we are in, we're in a lot of trouble. Man has turned from God, and is on the road of rebellion, having pleasure in sin. And that's why we need the gospel. So it's just, it's an it's a, it's a, it's a interesting study this morning. I was going to say a good study. It is a good study. It's a great study. But it's not one of the easier ones to hear. Because the Bible tells us very clearly about the unrighteousness of man. The unrighteousness of man. We are lost we're in trouble we need to know that so that verse 16 we can understand the power of the gospel to save us because we are in in desperate need of salvation one last thought by way of introduction there are people today bible teachers preachers it doesn't matter there are people today who who purposefully ignore and minimize the teaching of God's word on man's sin and God's wrath. There are people today who on purpose minimize the teaching of God's word on man's sin, his condition as, as lost and wicked, and the wrath of God on man because of his sin. Because it's not very popular, it's not very, it's not very pleasing, it doesn't, it doesn't you know, excite people and make them feel good. And those people are wrong. It, they're, you cannot ignore the fact of Romans chapter 1 and then chapters 2 and 3 as he gets into it that man is, is in desperate need of salvation because we're sinners and the wrath of God is upon us. So, so there's a balance. To conclude the introduction part here, there's a balance. We, we need to, God, for God so loved the world and God commended his love toward us that while we're yet sinners, but we also need to say sin is Real, we are condemned in our sin. Man is apart from God. And Romans chapter 1 makes it very clear. So number one, this morning, you see the picture there of the man bowing down to his idols. He's bowing down to it's whatever he decides to make. As he says, here's my God, and yet the creator is the one who is God and calls us back to him. So number one, notice this morning, we need righteousness. Paul points out the message, so I'm, I'm connecting them. I'm, I want us to see Paul's flow of thought as we get into his first point this morning, right? He, Paul points out the message of salvation in the gospel in verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You guys know what the word salvation means, right? It means to be rescued, to be delivered. This is why he wants to preach the gospel in Rome, verse 15. Like everywhere else, we need to be saved. And the gospel, verse 16, is the power of God unto deliverance, to rescuing, to everyone who believes. That's what it says in verse 16. This is where we find the answer. The good news of salvation from our sin is found in preaching the, the person of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So his first four in verse 16, it tells us why he wants to preach the gospel of because the, it's the power of God and salvation to everyone that believes it. And then his next four, verse 17, he points out what is in the gospel that delivers us. Verse 17, for therein, you see that, the gospel of Christ, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. 
Paul wants to preach the gospel of Christ because that is where sinners find righteousness. You got to keep these two words in mind this morning. The main point of our passage is the wickedness and sinfulness of man. And that stands in clear contrast. Listen, God is holy. God is righteous. For a person, for a human being, to think that they can match and meet up to God's standard of holiness is to deny every teaching of God's work. For a, for a person to think that they can do enough good works to level up with God in His holiness and His righteousness, they are denying the truth. They are deceiving themselves. Our sinfulness is in contrast to God's perfect righteousness and holiness. The righteousness of God, verse 17. So here's a verse we probably all know. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is the problem. That's why we need rescue. Because the glory of God, get the word glory as in his greatness, his, his, his beauty, his, um, just his, his wonder, the, the glory, the, the, he's exalted, he's lifted up, he's magnified, the greatness of God. We have fallen short of that because we are sinners. So the, the contrast is clear this morning that the righteousness of God needs to be brought to our sinful lives. It's the only way we can be made right with God. By His righteousness being given to us. Because on our own we are not righteous. So notice the flow of thought here. I want to preach the gospel in Rome. Verse 15. Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God and the salvation. And then verse 17. Because that's where we find the answer. The righteousness of God. There is no good news if we do not need saved. There's no good news if we don't need saved. In other words, good news is because we're in a bad way. But there's no good news if we don't need saved because nothing's wrong. The righteousness of God, though, are you with me? The righteousness of God is our greatest need. We are sinners, but Jesus died to make, to make us righteous in Christ. God provides forgiveness and cleansing in Christ. The gospel is our only hope. For being made right with God. Because therein, verse 17, is the righteousness of God revealed. Now, that's all we're going to say about that. Because that's actually where Paul concludes. Romans chapter 1, verses 16, 17 and 18. Starts us on this journey of man's sin. And God's answer for our sin in the righteousness of Christ. We're going to end there in Romans chapter 3. Where Paul says, the righteousness of Christ is provided for us. In the work of Christ on the cross to save us from our sin. So that's that's where Paul's going to take us and where we're going to end. He'll conclude with this truth of the righteousness of God in Christ. But what we're seeing here is the flow of thought. Paul preaches the gospel because that's the power of God and the salvation. Because we need the righteousness of God in our sin. Now notice one other thought here before we leave verse 17. How the righteousness of God is received. What does it say in verse 17? For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from heaven, or from revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And that's not the first time it's mentioned. What does it say in verse 16? It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it. Same word. Believing is faith. Faith is believing. So the gospel is our only hope, and it's received by faith. Everyone who believes, verse 16, is saved. And that has always been the case. Salvation has always been by faith. If you'll notice the phrase in verse 17, from faith to faith, the idea there is out of faith comes saving salvation. Out of faith comes the faith that saves. It, 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 Paul's using a play on words. He wants us to realize the importance of faith. So from faith, if you come to Christ out of faith, you're trusting in Him, it leads to faith, which is the faith that brings salvation because you put your faith in Christ. It, it's just one of those wonderful phrases in the Bible that gets us to focus on how can I come to this place of salvation? How can I receive the power of God that saves me from my sin? From faith to faith. It starts with faith. I recognize my need of Christ. 
And it leads to um, humbling myself and relying on him. From faith to faith gives us the essence of repentance and trusting in Christ for salvation. Because it starts with faith that recognizes I have a problem. And it leads to faith that says Jesus is my only hope. From faith to faith is a way to say a person says I need Jesus because I'm a sinner and therefore I'm putting my faith and trust in him to save me. From faith, recognizing that I can't save myself, to faith, Jesus is the way that I can be saved. From faith to faith. So verse 17 makes it clear. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel from faith to faith. And then he ends it by saying, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. In other words, he says, the righteous, the ones who are of God, the, the people of God, it all comes to faith. The just shall live by faith. The, the righteous are connected to God by faith. They live because they have faith, because they put their trust in him. Old Testament believers, uh, think with me now. Old Testament believers look forward by faith in the promise of God to what he would do, right, to save them. Now we as New Testament believers look back to the fulfillment of God's promise and what he would do to save us from our sin. Christ on the cross and rising from the dead. We believe that Jesus died to save us from our sin, just like the Old Testament believers believed that God would provide a perfect sacrifice. So from faith to faith, in that sense of from the, from the beginning of faith and, and those who believed in the old to the faith of those today, it's always been about faith. But the main thought is when a person says, I am in trouble, my need is for God, therefore I'm going to put my faith in Christ because he's the one who died to save me from my sin. Faith brings new life and salvation. The just shall live by faith. Faith brings new life and salvation. That's the point. We live because Jesus is our righteousness and hope. We are the just, in this verse, we are the people of God because God has rescued us from our sin in Christ. So, the flow of thought, right? Paul wants to preach the gospel in Rome because the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. In the gospel, we find God's answer for our sin. Therein is the righteousness of God is revealed. Jesus giving his righteous life for our sinful one. And that righteousness is re received by faith. Number two, why is that important? You see how the flow of thought? This is Paul's fourth four. Did you, right? Paul's fourth four in verse 18. Look at verse 16. Here's the first four. Four, I'm not ashamed. The second four is in verse 17. For there is righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And um, no, the second four is in verse 16. The first one's for I'm not ashamed. The second one's for it's the power of God. That's the work of the gospel. That's why we're not ashamed of it. The third four is there is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. That's how it's received. And the fourth four, verse 18, gives the reason why we need God's righteousness and salvation for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Now, this is where Paul goes in his first main point about this whole burden of the gospel. Listen, the first main point is we're in trouble. Again, there's no good news if there's no difficulty. I mean, you could come and knock on my door and sell me a hot dog, and I just don't want it, I don't care. But you come and knock on my door and you tell me I'm dying in my sin, facing an eternity separated from a God who loves me in a place called hell. Now I've got a problem. And that's why people don't want to hear that when you knock on their door. <laughs> Here's the point. Here's Paul's burden is for the gospel. I want to preach it in Rome. Uh, it's the power of God. It's, I mean, it's the righteousness of God. It's received by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. We are under God's wrath. Look, okay, so let's just skip to chapter 3, and it says Jesus is the, is the end of righteousness for all who believe. And Isn't this great? The cross is such a wonderful gift of God. And isn't God, God's love is so wonderful. And you can receive it this morning. And, and, and let's put our faith in Christ and, and let him save us from our sin. We can do that. We can just jump right to that. But then we're missing the burden. 
of why a person would want to come to Christ. So we can't skip Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. We just can't do it. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to come back to this next week and the week after and the week after. That doesn't mean that's all I preach for myself. Listen to me. For myself, and how awful I am and how ugly sin is and how de you know, depraved I am and corrupt and evil. That's not... No, because there is salvation, and then there's life, and then there's the fruit of the Spirit, and there's a wonderful work that God's doing, even though we struggle with sin. But we can't ignore it. We can't just sweep it under the rug and never talk about it. Paul's fourth four in verse 18 in this sequence, in this thinking of his, uh, uh, under inspiration, the point of his message is, the reason we need God's righteousness and salvation, because the wrath of God is poured out upon sin. God hates sin. We, we don't hear this today. God hates sin. And those who practice sin are under the wrath and judgment of God. That's what the Bible says. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So here's the next phrase. God hates sin. Those who practice sin are under the wrath and judgment of God. We cannot separate the sin from the sinner. And I know we say this, and it's true. God loves the sinner and hates the sin. He does. But a sinner who practices sin and does not repent is under the wrath of God. God's judgment is upon them. Yes, God loves them, but God also has his wrath upon them. A sinner sins because he's a sinner. Listen, a sinner sins because he is a sinner. He's not a sinner because he sins. Now, I'm not trying to usurp I'm just trying to get us to think. Here's the next phrase. This will help us understand it. In other words, we are not basically good people who just make mistakes every now and then. That's what the world wants us to think. This is the teaching today that ignores the truth of the Bible. The popular preacher today. Just use, I mean, I could use any name, I, whatever. You, you hear them. You're just, a, you're a good person. Just, you know, just try not to make so many mistakes. Or you're a good person and God loves you more than you'll ever know, which is true. God loves them more than you'll ever know. But they're not a good person. They're in rebellion against God in their sin. But no, you're a good person and you just make some mistakes. So let God's love just kind of fl flow over you and, and just make you feel good. We're not sinners because we sin, you know, we do things are wrong. We are sinners because we are naturally, by nature, in rebellion against God. Therefore, now think about that, therefore we are all under the wrath of God. Yes, God loves us while we are yet sinners, but his wrath is still upon us until we come to Christ, until we turn in repentance and faith to Jesus. Jonathan Edwards, you probably know the name, his message, sinners in the hand of an angry God, is biblical. Someone, one of the Bible teachers of today, who's very popular, has taken, has taken uh, uh, issue with Jonathan Edwards' sermon. This person said we should not be preaching a Jonathan Edwards type sermon today because God's love is what we need to hear. And I agree, God's love is what the Bible teaches. But until we hear that we are sinners under the hands of an angry God, in the hands of an angry God, then we're not going to want to hear about God's love. Because my life's basically good. I just might need God to help me a little bit. So this whole passage this morning is very important. God's love and wrath, if, if God's love and wrath is both real and in perfect balance. God can love me in my awfulness, in my rejection of him, in my rebellion against him, in my unrighteousness and corruptness. God can love me because of what Christ did on the cross. But until I come by faith to Christ, I am under God's wrath. They are both real and in perfect balance. Jesus received sinners. Jesus also condemned sinners when they remain in their sin. God can't overlook our sin. His justice and holiness demands that he judge sin, so he judged it in Christ. We need Jesus' righteousness. Verse 17, for therein the gospel of Christ is the righteousness of God revealed. Why? Because, verse 18, the wrath of God 
We are under God's wrath because we are all guilty. And that's what Paul makes very clear. Number one, as he starts to talk about his burden of the gospel, for the wrath of God. What Paul makes very clear as he helps us understand the gospel is we are sinners. We are under God's wrath. And so number three this morning, and just these thoughts then in these verses, we're not going to take a lot of time on them because they're self-explanatory, but very clearly he says we're guilty. That's the, that's the point. That's the point he's making for us in this passage. We are guilty. And then he'll conclude by saying, he'll point out to us how our guilt is displayed in the awfulness of our sin. The end of verse 18 takes us to Paul's main point this morning. Look at the end of verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all godless and unrighteous men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. We are holding the truth in our... The, the word hold there, suppressing it. We, are, we as fallen mankind are suppressing the truth. Paul starts to talk about why the wrath of God is upon us. How we... What does he say in verse 18? ungodliness and unrighteousness to men, he starts to describe that. We have rejected God and are going our own way. It says unrighteousness and ungodliness, who hold, who? Against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who? This is how he describes us. We are holding the truth in unrighteousness. We are suppressing, we are denying the truth in God. We are denying God. And we're acting like we're the ones in charge. That's the picture of this guy kneeling down, bowing down before whatever he decides to make. We have changed God into our own image and likeness. And we have turned to our own way. What's the, what's the Bible saying? We have turned everyone to his own way. And it's a way of wickedness and unrighteousness. We're guilty. And Paul uses the word because in the next verses twice to show us our guilt. Number one, we are without excuse. I already had it on the screen there. Number one, verses 19 and 20. Because, verse 19, we are without excuse. Look at verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Number one, Paul says we are guilty because we are without excuse. We are suppressing the truth and unrighteousness and wickedness because God has made himself known. Verse 19. God has revealed himself to man in creation of the Bible. In creation, in the Bible, and in Christ, God has revealed himself to us. This is where the Bible speaks very clearly to the evidence of God all around us. We don't make that up. Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 make it very clear that creation points to and speaks of and reveals to us a God, the creator. That's, that's under inspiration. That's what God said his creation was meant to do. So we read Psalm 19 on purpose this morning. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day, under a speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no voice nor language where their speech is not heard. Creation is a universal language. Paul's main emphasis in these verses is creation in verse 20. It's his main emphasis. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. And what does it tell us? Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. A willful rejection of the truth denies that there is a God when we look at creation. This is what the Bible teaches. It is a willful rejection of the truth to deny God's hand in his creation, in this world. So just by way of application in our culture today, as it has always been, it's a willful rejection of the truth to believe in another way that man and the world came about, which is evolution. It's a willful rejection of the truth to believe in evolution. That's why evolution is, is propounded, is taught. It's not fact. It's an attack against God. Satan is replacing the truth with a lie. God's creation points us to God, God's attributes of eternal power, and his Godhead, his deity, his authority, his godness, he's in charge, are clearly seen in creation. 
Only God can create. Only God can make all things work. God is God. The heavens declare. Yes, there is a God, and He is in charge. That's what creation tells us, but we deny that. You see what it says in verse 19? That which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. So we are without excuse. So verse 18, we are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. We are holding the truth in unrighteousness because, number one, we look at creation and we say, nah, I'm God. Number two, we are guilty because we have rejected God. So he just continues the thought, so he uses his next because in verse 21. Because, so he says, because we're holding the truth and unrighteous because God has revealed himself and Therefore, number two, verse 21, because that when they knew God, we are guilty because now they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Here's the, the Bible's uh, word, the Bible's testimony about what we've done. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I mean, that is the Bible's commentary on man's rejection of God. We think we're wise, we're fools. And we've changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. And that's part of the image on the screen there. Who, what else can we come up with when we reject the true God of heaven? Number one, we're guilty because we're without excuse. God revealed himself. Number two, we're guilty because in seeing that truth, we now have rejected God. We are also guilty because when we knew and saw God in his creation, we did not glorify him, verse 21. We did not recognize it. Now think about it. What does it mean to glorify him? We didn't recognize and bow before this great God of heaven. We did not submit to him. We turned everyone to his own way. We made our own image of God. We didn't thank him. We didn't honor him. We turned to our own desires and wants. Now, as I studied this, my mind went to Adam and Eve in the garden. God created them, and he placed them in a beautiful garden. And what's the first thing he said to them? Of all the trees of the garden, you may freely eat. Listen, God gave them every, just such a great God and blessing his, his, his image, in his image creation, man and woman, humanity, with his greatness, with his goodness. Here it is, Adam and Eve, enjoy it! But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Have you ever thought about what that means? And there's a lot of discussion on it, but just think through those words, knowledge of good and evil. God wanted Adam and Eve to obey him, to follow him, to listen to him. He would be their source of right and wrong. To eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, like Satan said, they would become gods. They would be able to make their own decisions. They would be able to learn how they can have knowledge and make their own decisions without God anymore. Can you see how that tree of the knowledge of good and evil? So the choice was... For Adam and Eve to recognize, look at the whole passage. The choice was for Adam and Eve to recognize that God created them. He's God. We will glorify him. We will honor him, obey him, submit to him, love him, and worship him. Or it was, we can find our own way, the knowledge of good and evil. I can make my own decisions. I can plan my own direction. So this whole idea is really reflected in the garden with Adam and Eve when they knew God, but yet they did not glorify him as God, and they became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. The knowledge of good and evil then led them away from God. Can you see how it all flows together? Adam and Eve knew God, but they didn't glorify him as God. They set themselves up as God, and their foolish hearts were darkened. They became vain and empty and useless in their desires and plans and goals. They wanted to be God, but they became fools. Now, you don't, have, don't stop with Adam and Eve, because where did this lead? Cain and Abel, of course, Cain killed Abel. And then where do we go? We have the foolishness of man. It just, it just completely comes, God's commentary completely comes to pass. Be claim, be declaring themselves to be wise, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And we have this awful picture of a sinful humanity that is ignorant, ignorant of the truth, rejecting God up to the flood. Get it? Up to the flood. It is God saw the heart of man. It was only evil continually. This is what man has been doing since the fall, folks. We are proclaiming ourselves to be wise, professing ourselves. We are fools. We're, we think we're wise, but we're not. We're dead in trespasses and sins. We're under God's wrath, verse 18. 
We've changed the incorruptible God into our own image, verse 23. Changed the glory of uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man. Birds, four-footed beasts, creatures. That's foolish. This is foolish. It's blasphemy. And that's why we as sinful humans are guilty and under the wrath of God. So Paul ends by pointing out our sin. Paul describes our condition. We're guilty. Now Paul describes the, and here's the thing of this phrase, the evidence of sin. And what these verses show is verses 24 through 32, the evidence of sin is overwhelming. Paul describes our condition. We've turned from God and God has given us over to sin. We are in a bad way. <laughs> what we need to understand here in these verses is that sin has brought us to this point. When you and I look as Christians, now let's step back for a moment as a believer. When we look at the things of man, we need to understand that the source of all that is happening in, in and through man, in a fallen world, we need to understand that the source is his lostness before God, his, his foolishness before God, his, what's the phrase, his uh, suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. This is where it leads. The problem today in culture is not external. It's the sinful heart of man. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And here is a picture of that sin. We are guilty, yes, and now Paul describes our condition as sinners. We need to understand that sin brings us to this point. We are in desperate need of salvation, verse 16. The, the power of God, the gospel of Christ is the power of God and salvation. Paul is giving us the evidence of our guilt. Are any of these things pleasing to God? Are any of these things according to righteousness and holiness? Look at verse 24. First of all, uncleanness. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. That's the word for a lack of purity, a lack of, of, of uh, cleanliness. You see the cleanness there. Through the lusts of their own hearts. Now, now don't miss that. It's the heart. It's always the heart. That's where sin comes from. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately. The lusts of their own hearts to dishonor. And then it comes outward. Dishonoring their own bodies between themselves. Who change the truth of God into a lie. The heart changes the truth of God into a lie. And worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forevermore. Amen. Paul says, number one, there's this uncleanness in our guilt. Sin leads to uncleanness. Given over to the lust of our hearts. Dishonoring ourselves. Think about that. This, this isn't, none of this is good. And then changing the truth of God into a lie. That's where this goes. That's where our guilt takes us. We are following our own lusts and desires instead of God's purpose that's the epitome of our defilement. We're missing God, verse 25. We have changed the image of God. And now we are. The end of verse 25, we aren't blessing it. We don't see what really matters. We're far from that purpose of our creation. Number one, we are unclean. Number two, we're sinners because of our vile affection. Again, this doesn't need a lot of defining. You just read the words and you understand. Sin leads to vile affections, verse 26. Remember verse 24, it says, God also gave them up to uncleanness. Look at verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections this time. Now think about that word, vile affections, desires, vile, evil desires. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. So we have this natural, this, this, don't think of like mother nature. Think of God's plan and creation. That's the nature referred to here. What was God's original purpose? Natural use against that which is against nature, verse 27. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly. You just, the whole passage is against nature, improper, against what's seemly and right and good, and receiving themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. What I find very interesting here, same issues we deal with today, homosexuality and lesbianism, that's what's referenced here. Same issues they dealt with back in, in, in Lot's day and, and, and so on and so forth. It's a twisting. This is what's interesting. It's a perverting, a twisting of what God originally intended to be for good. 
The natural use of the woman and the man. What did God create in the garden? Adam and Eve, and he brought them together, man and wife, to a man and a woman. Uh, God created the natural use of the body between a man and a woman in a marriage covenant. But sin, are you with me? This is the context. We are guilty. Here's the evidence of our sin. It leads to vile affections, which is unnatural, a twisting of God's original purpose and plan for the desire of a man and a woman in marriage. Homosexuality is a picture of sin's defilement and corruption. I find it interesting that God uses that as the picture. Because it's clear. You can't argue with it. Although we have many people today who say it is natural. And it should be accepted and it should be condoned as just, a, as just a love. But yet the Bible makes it clear here that this is one of the very evidences of our sin. In, in number one, being guilty before God. Because we're suppressing the truth. We're holding the truth. So now the evidences are vile affections. Lastly, number three. We're given over to a reprobate mind. Paul concludes our condition by pointing out how our corrupt thinking leads to our sinful behavior. Verse 28. He gave us over, verse 24, to uncleanness. He gave us over, verse 26, to vile affections. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. We don't want you, God. So God gave them over. Gave them over. Gave them up to a reprobate mind. To do those things which are not convenient. We have a reprobate, rebellious, obstinate mind and heart. Going, We are going to go our own way no matter what. And that is unrighteousness and ungodliness. Remember verse 18? Ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Look at verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Don't miss the connection. That's exactly where God's wrath. Why we're under God's wrath. Being filled with all unrighteousness. And then he just lists fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, the spiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, etc., 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 who... Knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do that. It's all summed up. I just read those verses and I, it doesn't take much to explain it, does it? It's all summed up by pointing out that we are so far from God in our sin and we don't care. The natural heart of man, until he is under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, loves his sin. The natural heart of man is separated from God. And what does it say? Verse 28, didn't like to retain God in their knowledge? Okay. The natural heart of man loves his sin and takes pleasure in those that sin. God's judgment is sure, verse 18. The wrath of God, verse 32, worthy of death. And by the way, that's not physical death. That's the second death, the spiritual death. Worthy of death because of God's wrath. But we are ignorant in our sin. We are deceived. And we will therefore be destroyed if we don't repent. This last picture in Reprobate Mind, verses 28 through 32, it just, it, it's such a clear picture of where we are in our sin as mankind in refusing to acknowledge God. This, those words, that, that's the picture of mankind. Now, one of the thoughts, and you see this, obviously you see it, and when you read commentaries, you, you hear it said, and I'll say it right now, not all of us are as bad as we can be, but the source, listen to me, the source of all sin is the same, the fallen heart of man. So just, and he's going to get to this in chapter 2, we're not going to get into it now, but just because you say, I don't do those things, doesn't mean you're free from sin. We, we say that because some people say, oh, that's just making things look bad. It is making things look bad, and there are people that really are given over to their sin in complete unrighteousness and ungodliness. But just because we say, well, those aren't seen in my life, doesn't mean the heart is not separated from God because of sin. It is. That's the problem because of the heart, right? That's always been the point that God's been making in this passage. The heart, the unrighteous of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness, the heart is where the problem starts. Uncleanness, vile affection, 
It all comes from the heart. Verse 21, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God to the image made like the corruptible man. God gave them over because the heart turned from God. So, the gospel. We're going to close with a wonderful song. You'll know it. It's a wonderful song. The gospel is our only hope for our salvation. We need the righteousness of Jesus. We are sinners. We've turned from God to go our own way. If you don't believe the Bible, then you're not going to believe that you need help. But if you take God in His Word, a passage like this this morning, you're saying, God, help us, God, help us, help, help, Lord, thank you. As a Christian this morning, you're saying, thank you, Jesus. Because we're in trouble. And God's wrath is upon us. But think. Verse 17. For therein, in the gospel of Christ, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Faith will bring us righteousness and life. This is where the gospel starts. It starts with unrighteousness. Because we need the righteousness of God. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for showing us our need. May none of us leave here this morning saying, uh, I, I'm good. I don't need any help. Lord, may none of us leave here this morning thinking that we can do something on our own to make our lives whole, to solve a problem that we don't even really admit to. Lord, thank you may it, for bringing us to the place where we can say, God, I need help. I am in trouble. I am a sinner. The wrath of God is upon my unrighteousness and my ungodliness. And God, I pray all of us are saying immediately then, thank you for Jesus. Thank you, God, that you've saved me from my sin. And that's where we want to stay, Lord. That's where we want to tell, we'll point others. Yes, there's sin. Yes, you're a sinner. Yes, you're under the judgment of God. But yes. There is a gospel, a good news. There's a sin. Thank you for Jesus, and thank you for the hope that we have in him and our salvation. Help us tell others, because everyone's guilty and in need of Jesus Christ to save them from their sin. In Jesus' name, amen.